Any of you lose power in the last couple of days? Some of you have, and uh, a lot of rain still coming. They got more. I thought it was going to be sunshiny today and Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and uh, it turned on in a hurry. But uh, I'm thankful that you are here, and you made it all the way from your car into the building and didn't turn into a Methodist. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. Let's stand together and open our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. And uh, we got a lot of ground to cover in a short time to do it. So you have to really bear with me today. <clears throat> but um, we're going to be talking about in this series, The Invisible War, The Unseen War. The title of the message this morning is The Work of God's Angels. It's really a continuation from the sermon that we had last week. And we're going to look a little deeper into it. And it's kind of a, an educational type sermon, some of the stuff you may have heard before, some of the stuff you think, well, I didn't know that. Uh, but I pray that it will be a blessing to you and that we'll have a deeper understanding of the work of angels than we've ever had before. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13, And God never said to any of the angels, Sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. Therefore, angels are only servants. What are angels? Servants. servants. Spirits sent to care for people who will inherit salvation. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. It's so encouraging to us. And we thank you so much for your special agents, the angels that you send in behalf of us. And, and you take care of us. And they minister to us, encourage us. So, Lord, I pray this morning that we will leave here having a greater understanding of all that you do for us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. If you were to think about how do people view the world, what would you think it is? I, I'm going to tell you that there are basically three categories in which we view the world. And we fit into one of these categories, maybe two, or maybe all three to some respect. There are basically three categories in which we view the world. Here's the first one is high religion. Now, don't run too far with that because the word religion here may not mean exactly what you would instantly interpret that word to mean. But basically, high religion is the study of things that pertain to God. And it's the study of the Word of God. So, we study the Word of God in order to understand God, understand more about Him. Now, we're never going to understand everything about God. If we could understand everything about God, He wouldn't be much of a God, right? Our minds are finite. He has an infinite mind. So, there's no way we're going to understand everything. But we read in the Bible things about heaven and hell and salvation and grace and uh, all of those things that we read about in the Bible and have a grasp, at least to some degree, of what do these things mean. Now, Americans don't always agree on what these things mean. Some people, some denominations believe in eternal salvation. Once you're saved, you're always saved. That would be us. And others would say, no, it's possible that you could lose your salvation. I'm so thankful that uh, the Bible teaches us that when you're in God's hand, uh, in the Lord's hand, Jesus, He puts uh, the Holy Spirit's hand around that hand. He puts uh, the, the God's hand around that hand. In order for the devil to be strong enough to get to you, he'd have to be strong enough to pry open the hand of God, to pry open the hand of the Holy Spirit, to pry open the hand of Jesus to get to you. May I ask you, is the devil that strong? No, he is not. He is not. And I'm also thankful because I would lose my salvation every time I played golf if that weren't the case. So, I'm thankful for, for this. Even though we don't always agree, there's a lot of things we do agree on. There's a second category that I submit to you this morning. So, you have high religion, and then you have those that believe in natural science. They believe in natural science. Now, I love science. I love biology. Most of you know that I majored in biology for three years because I wanted to become a dentist. And uh, God changed my heart and, and called me to preach. I changed my degree plan from uh, one of biology, majoring in biology, to psychology because I figured in the church world I'd be working with a whole lot of nuts. And sure enough, <laughs> sure enough. But what then is natural science? It's the study of things that are systematically arranged. We believe this because of this. We believe that because of that. And we just go through a, a system of understanding the world around us. It's things that we can observe, things that we can test. And then we draw conclusions from this natural science, the things that we study. It's really a study of the operation of general laws. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, like physics. If you drop something right now, what's going to happen? 
It's going to fall. Why is it going to fall? Because of gravity. So physics or molecules or atoms or gravity or photosynthesis or any of those kinds of things that we try to understand what do those things mean. So you have high religion, then you have natural science, and then you have low religion. High religion, natural science, and low religion. What is low religion? Well, it was really birthed out of the Eastern ideas of spirits, ghosts, things like that, demons, uh, ancestors and ancestor worship, earthly gods. Some even believed in trolls, and some believed in pixies, and some believe in gnomes, and some believe in fairies. And to them, they believe these things are absolutely real. But is there a purpose, a real purpose, for low religion? You know what it is? It's to explain things that we can't explain. To be able to explain things that high religion can't explain. To be able to explain things that natural science cannot explain. Now, this is kind of wordy, but hang with me. There's a missiologist by the name of Paul Hebert. And uh, Paul Hebert is a missiologist, which means he studies missions around the world, and how to do missions better, and, and the process of mission work. Here's what he wrote. Belief in the middle level began to die in the 17th and 18th centuries with the growing acceptance of Platonic dualism and of a science based on materialistic naturalism. The result was a secularization of science and a mystification of religion. That's kind of complicated, but here's what it really means. Most Americans function at a practical level, don't we? We function at a practical level. For example, if you got in your car today and it was raining, you might go look for an umbrella, right? That's a practical thing to do. I'm going to pop that thing open so I don't mess up my hair on the way in because Pastor Mark likes to see my hair awful nice looking, you know? Now, you think about the Sadducees. You ever heard of the Sadducees? The Sadducees, uh, they did not believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in spirits. They didn't believe in, in uh, miracles. And that's why they were sad, you see? <laughs> but they did believe in two things. Sadducees believed in a God in heaven. And they also believed in things you could touch and see. Natural science kind of things. So there is a God in heaven, and there are things that we can touch and see, and that's what they believed in. Now, here's our problem in America today. We have such ignorance concerning theology today, it's mind boggling. No one's teaching theology, no one's teaching doctrine, no one's teaching why do we believe what we believe, what we claim to believe, and how do we implement that into our lives. So, Western missionaries have a problem. When they're facing a situation, they're on a mission, they're doing missions somewhere, and they are facing a situation where that culture is wrapped up in low religion, they struggle with the supernatural because they really don't know a whole lot about the supernatural. And so you have these, these missionaries that sometimes are faced with an epidemic, let's say it's smallpox. And the people in that particular culture, they don't know what to do. The smallpox, are trying to restrain it and, and cure it and all that stuff is not working. And so they will begin to pray to their local deities. But then some will pray to what the missionaries have talked about. Who the missionaries have talked about? They'll pray to Jesus. They'll ask Jesus for help. And God will intervene. And then these missionaries say they will begin to see God working these wonderful miracles. And they see tangible results. But it's bizarre to them because they don't see it here in America. We don't see miracles very often here in America. Probably because we don't look for them. So you have Western missionaries. Then you have Western Christians. Western Christians are facing more interactions with people in our culture that are sort of in that middle category. And they've got questions, spiritual questions. And we don't know how to answer those spiritual questions. And as a result of not knowing how to answer these spiritual questions, people are turning to all kinds of bizarre things. Like astrology or horoscopes or fortune tellers or mediums even. And it's because there's a vacuum in their heart. Do you know this morning that God creates a God-sized hole in the heart of every single human when they're born? And the only one that can fill that God-sized hole is Jesus. 
And so all of us are born with that innate desire to know the truth. And so we're living in a very ignorant theologically world, church world, and we don't know how to share our faith with people that have some serious questions about life. Now here's the the issue. There are going to be some things that happen in life that we're not going to understand and cannot explain. Have any of you ever had something happen in your life? You say, I, I can't explain it. I don't know how it happened, Did you, I, but it happened. I can't explain it. You ever had that happen? All right, many of you. You've had these unexplainable things. Now, there was a mother that did something she should not have done. She pulled her van up to one of those quick trips. Inside the van was her four-year-old son and her 10-year-old daughter. And she said, I'm just going to be a minute, just going to pick up two things. I'll be right back out here. And she left the van running. You know what a four-year-old boy is going to do in a running van? He crawled up there and he moved that thing, the gear shift. He moved it, it went into neutral, and it started rolling backwards. About the same time the mother came out of the store, she sees the car rolling backwards and is headed toward a very busy highway with cars going in both directions, very busy. And she's like, she starts to scream. That draws the attention of other people. And everybody's turned to look and see what in the world is going on. And they see this, this uh, van cascading toward the highway. And all of a sudden, just like that, it came to a stop. And the mother runs over. She opens up the door. She makes sure that her her son and her daughter are okay. And then the son and the daughter begin to say, she asked them a question, how did the van stop? Were you able to put it back in gear? And they said, no, a man opened up the car door and reached in and put it in gear and then shut the car door. And the only people that saw that man that opened up the car door and put the car back in gear were that boy and that girl. Do you think that might have been an angel? I believe that it was in fact an angel. I want you to watch this video short. I wish you could watch all of it, but it's too long. So this is about a minute and a half. And it's about four people who witness angels being pulled out, or they, they, they witness angels pulling people out of uh, two different cars that were wrecked. Watch this video. 911, what's your emergency? We have a vehicle that is upside down and on fire. We need help now. Four lives intersected on Highway 6 in Crawford, Texas that day, but all say they had a supernatural encounter on that rain slicked road that changed their lives forever. Lisa's SUV slid into the path of Anthony's oncoming car. The impact flipped Lisa's SUV multiple times, crushing Anthony's car. Both drivers were trapped. Sherry and Cody Clemens saw the wrecked vehicles and raced to help. Sherry called 911. Then she cried out to God for a miracle. Cody climbed inside to try to pull Lisa from the growing flames. When I reached out, we grabbed each other's hands. There was another set of hands that grabbed our hands. As I saw Cody's hands, I saw a set of just white hands around his. As he started pulling me through, it was just a burst of white light. Before I knew it, we were both outside the vehicle. But the worst was far from over. There was this huge explosion, and the flames just completely rolled over the car and over Anthony, just consumed it in the black rolling flames. At that moment, another eyewitness saw a second miracle unfold. He seemed to just emerge through the door and he just kind of floated out on on the ground. So I believe that God sent supernatural angels here to help him get out of that vehicle. Imagine that. Just suddenly we find ourselves outside the car. Did you see that car? The one that was upside down? Completely mangled. No way they could have crawled out of that on their own. God still uses angels to this day to do miracles for people. That is why He created them. Now, last week we learned that the Bible speaks of angels 273 different times. How many times? We also learned that angels are created beings. They aren't like God. God's always been. There's never been a time when God was not. He has always been and will always be. Amen? But angels were created by God. And angels have the ability to physically manifest themselves. Many times they will manifest themselves and you will think that you're speaking to a human. We'll see this peppered all throughout the Bible, but in fact it is an angel of God. We also learn that angels don't marry, angels don't die, and there's a huge number of angels that exist. 
And we don't know how many that exist, but there's probably millions of angels that do in fact exist. They don't die. So their number is static. However many God created, there's still that many number of angels today. And then we learned also that in or the order of creation that angels rank a little higher than man. But there will be a day, the Bible says, that man will rank a little higher than angels. For it says that man will judge angels one day. So I want to talk about three things very quickly. So hang on to your seat. You ready? Here's the first thing. Angels help us act right. right. Look at the person next to you and say, act right. Fly straight. The Bible teaches us that God the Father is watching us. God the Son is watching us. God the Holy Spirit is watching us. But it also teaches us that angels are watching us. Angels are watching us. And we obey the Word of God because we love God, right? We, we fear God. Yes, there's a healthy fear of God. But primarily the reason we should obey the Word of God is because we love God. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. For I think God has exhibited us apostles last of all as men condemned to death because we have become a spectacle to the world both to angels and men. Now he's referring right here to those first century Christians and the crowds that would gather there in the Colosseums and people would gather in those stadiums or those Colosseums and watch the gladiators slaughter Christians. Maybe even lions would be let loose and they would slaughter the Christians. So he's talking, he's drawing a picture of an audience like those sitting in the stands there in the Colosseum, the audience. And here's what he's saying. He's trying to teach us this. Humans respond to audiences. Do you believe that? How do you act if you think somebody's watching you? Yeah, that's when you put on your Sunday best, right? Hopefully. Let's just say that one of you goes crazy and you decide to go to Walmart where your pastor's people are. (laughs) And you decide you're going to steal something. You're standing in the middle of the aisle and you look to your left and there's a security guard standing right there at the end of the aisle. And you look to your right and there's a police officer standing at the end, of, on, on that end of the aisle. Do you think for one moment that you're going to steal whatever it is you plan to steal? No. Because you know that you're being watched. You know, we, we like audiences. In many cases, our kids always wanted to know that Robin and I were at their games or performances or whatever it was. They want to know that you're there. Our grandkids want to know that Doc and Ra Ra and Mimi and Pops are at their games and watching them and, and cheering them on. And, and hopefully they do a little bit better, especially when you tell them, if you hit a home run, I'll give you 20 bucks. <laughs> they like that. They, they want to know that they're being watched. And here's what Scripture reminds us of. It reminds us of the steady gaze of angels. Now, Paul warns the women of Corinth because, guess what? You're not going to believe this, but the women in Corinth started rebelling against their men. Women's lib of their day. And you know what they did? They took the coverings off their head. We're not going to wear these coverings anymore. And they took them off their head. Now, bear with me, okay? Because before the Bible says a woman's not to cut her hair. She's supposed to have long hair for the glory of the Lord. But the reason back then that uh, women didn't cut their hair is because the only women that cut their hair back then were prostitutes. So either customs have changed or else in this room right now. (laughs) Things you never thought you'd hear from the pulpit, you know. So they used to wear these coverings on their head. And they rebelled. And here's what Paul said to them. Women should have covering on their head as a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. In other words, he's saying, listen, ladies, the angels of God are watching you and they're seeing this rebellion in your heart. Jesus used this same reasoning over in Matthew chapter 18, where he defended the place of children in the kingdom of God. He defended their place. And he reminds, he reminds us there that the angels in heaven continually see the face of the Heavenly Father in heaven. So there are angels looking upon, even as we speak, the face of God. And Paul tells Timothy to not show any bias or partiality because God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and angels are all watching. So we're not supposed to show any partiality because we are being watched. Look at the person next to you and say, you're being watched. 
preaching, sometimes my preaching buddies will, back when T.W. Hunt was still living, uh, you don't know T.W. Hunt, great writer, wrote many books on the subject of prayer. He spoke literally all over the world on the subject of prayer. And he was a member here. And some of my buddies said, what's it like preaching on the subject of prayer with T.W. Hunt sitting in the audience? I said, what do you think it's like? You know, what do you think it's like? I got something that really dawned on me one day. There are greater dignitaries than T.W. that are here every single sunny, Sunday. God the Father is watching. God the Son's watching. God the Holy Spirit is watching. The angels of God are watching. Now, churches come in all sizes. You may not believe this. Here in Houston, you tell people this, they don't believe you. But the average size church in America runs just slightly under 100. That's the average size. It doesn't matter if you're in a church running 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 or 50,000 or anywhere in between. The Bible tells us there are always angels about the business of watching us, even in worship. And they're watching whether or not you're paying attention. They watch as to whether or not you're singing from your heart, praising the Lord. They are watching us as we, quote, unquote, worship the Lord. They are watching us. Here's the second thing. Knowing angels exist should motivate us to be nice or kind to everyone. Hebrews 13, 2 says, Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some entertained angels without knowing it. Hospitality comes very easy to some. Uh, Laura Hazelwood, who is our singles minister, our senior adult minister, minister, has the gift of hospitality. She makes people feel welcome. Lois Wilkie has the gift of hospitality. I could name many, many other people that I know here in this church that have the gift of hospitality. And they're just friendly with people, and, and they make them feel like family. Here's what the writer is saying. You better be nice to everyone because you might just be entertaining an, an angel unaware. I told you last week about me rolling my car four times, about a man coming, appearing to help me. And he stayed with me until the ambulance came, and I looked around, and he was gone. I don't know if that was an angel or just a human being. I don't know, but I know he just mysteriously, he didn't say bye, or I'm praying for you, or thinking about you, or nothing. He was just gone. So maybe that was an angel. There was a lady that had a doctor's appointment, and it was a rainy day, and she had a flat tire. And she's on the side of the road, it's raining cats and dogs, and a man stops to pick her up and says, you know, can I help you? She said, well, I'm late for my doctor's appointment. He said, I can take you there. And she said, I don't know why. Ordinarily, I would not have accepted the ride. But I just felt a peace in my heart that it was okay to go with this man. So I got in the car with him. He drove me to the doctor's office. He got out of the car with an umbrella and walked me to the doctor's office and went inside with me and made sure that I got in okay. And then I went up to the nurse that was at the reception desk and said, I'm so sorry. I'm late for my appointment. I had a flat tire. And, but if it weren't for this man right back here, I wouldn't have made it at all. And the lady said, what are you talking about? You walked in alone. Maybe that was an angel of God. Well, consider this. We spend a lot of money on the grounds here at this church. We spend a lot of money on furnishing the rooms in this church. We spend a lot of money on heating and cooling our facilities. We spend a lot of money on maintenance and janitorial staff. We spend a lot of money on music, a lot of money on lighting, a lot of money on sound, but I want to tell you something. We want to have a top-notch preschool area, and we do. We, have, we want a top-notch, a top-notch uh, children's area, and we've got one. But all of that can be instantly undone after spending years building up your reputation if you treat one person badly. Maybe you go to a restaurant after we're through here, and you, and you treat a waiter like they're less than a dog. And they happen to know that you're from Spring Baptist Church. What kind of feelings are they going to have about Spring Baptist Church? Or you treat your neighbor unkindly and they know that you're a so-called Christian and that you attend Spring Baptist Church, but you're rude and mean and unkind to them. And they know that, that the way you've been acting. And that, what are they going to think of our church? Not much, I can tell you that. Maybe if you treat one church visitor rudely or unkindly, or they don't get their hands shaking because you're not being very perceptive of those around you. 
and they walk out the door. Not one person speaks to them. Everything we've done can be undone by the act of one unkind Christian. So the Bible says be kind. Everybody say be kind. Here's the last thing. Knowing God's Word will help us identify counterfeit angels. In 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, let me rephrase that. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. <laughs> some will get that, some won't. Anyway, even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. The Mormon religion is built upon a counterfeit angel. Joseph Smith claimed that Moroni, Moroni spoke to him in a vision and laid out all the ground rules that basically became the basis or foundation of the Mormon religion. And by the way, Joseph Smith was a well-known liar and horse thief. That's historical fact. But he believed that. And I want to tell you something. I love everybody. But the Mormon religion contradicts the Word of God. I don't care what any religion says, if it goes against what God's Word teaches, it's not true. And they contradict the Word of God on the Trinity, on the person of Christ and who they believe He is, and justification by faith alone. They contradict all of that. And now we have five million Mormons that have based their faith upon a counterfeit angel. Paul warns of this. In Colossians chapter 2, he says, Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self abasement and the worship of angels. Did you know that true angels have no desire whatsoever to be worshiped? If they're a true angel, they don't want to be worshiped, they don't want to be prayed to. They're not God. A true angel will say, Don't you pray to me and don't you worship me. There's only one worthy of being prayed to and worshiped, and that's the Lord God Almighty. Amen. He's the only one. If an angel, a so-called angel, tells you anything other than that, they're a counterfeit angel. Now, I'm going to have to wrap this up because we're running out of time. Do you need an angel? Amen. Every one of us do. Amen. All of us need angels in our life. They are God's agents sent to help us. Maybe you need one. Maybe you've got a friend or a family member, someone you dearly love that needs an angel. And you just pray and say, God, would you send an angel? To bring conviction to them. God, would you send an angel to bring encouragement to them? God, would you send an angel to show them the truth because they're on a, the wrong pathway right now? And you could ask God to do that. And God is faithful to do so.